Check out great deals throughout the store at Safeway. This week at Safeway, get mega packs of USDA Choice Boneless Beef Chuck Roast for $3.97 per pound with digital coupon limit two packages. Plus, Hass Avocados are 10 for $10 member price. And get Fuji Apples for just 77 cents per pound with digital coupon. Also this week at Safeway, get selected varieties of Lucerne Milk Gallons for the member price of $3.99 each when you buy two. Visit Safeway.com or head into your local store for more deals. It's important to properly dispose of unwanted medication or sharps. MedProject offers free and convenient disposal options near you. To learn more, call 844-MEDPROJECT or visit medproject.org. Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. Good evening, Alibiers. Hope you're doing good. This is the second time we've met today. And I wanted to go ahead and do this Wagner episode today because I have found in the past covering trials, when you start getting into medical examiner stuff and with this many victims, if you don't stay on top of it, you'll get lost. And we'll be doing this for two weeks. So I have got that ready to go for the first two victims. And... We'll explain how they're doing it after our song fact of the day. Our second one. Uh, Hey guys, literally try to find the wrecking crew to watch on documentary. You will thank me later. Uh, Born in the USA. You probably thought this song was just about being patriotic and being American, but this song is actually a major criticism of how Vietnam veterans were treated after they returned home. And also, another little fun fact, Born in the USA was the first CD manufactured in the United States for commercial release. So go listen to the lyrics. It kind of makes sense. I did not uh, know that. I may have forgotten it. But anyways, Um, so can I just say that I look at crime scene photos a lot. I did not get to see these. But my buddy from Twitter, Big E, He is chasing paper 89 on Twitter. He is local to this case and he's been sitting in and he is no lightweight when it comes to crime scene photos. We've discussed them. We've shared them. We've talked about them. And he said that at one point he had just seen enough and he had to look away. So to me, that speaks volumes after talking with him regularly for over two years. And we knew these were brutal, brutal crimes, but we're really starting to get a picture of just how evil and brutal um, this was. So how they're doing this, and I think it's very smart to keep everything together. So we know the last couple of days, they were talking about the crime scene at Chris Sr.'s and where Gary was. And then talking about all the evidence they found, all the ballistics, we went through that yesterday. And now they have the medical or the forensic pathologist on. I'm sorry. She's a forensic pathologist. Karen Lumen. She was great on the stand. So tomorrow, now that they're done with Chris and Gary's crime scene and their autopsies, they will bring back the BCI agent who testified yesterday, the guy with the beard. He'll explain the crime scene and then the pathologist will come back and talk about the condition of their bodies. I think that's a really good way to keep this kind of in order. Because if you just do autopsy, 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 or crime scene after crime scene, it gets really confusing, and it can get really boring, especially talking about ballistics half the day. So, like I said, witness, Dr. Karen Lumen is a forensic pathologist, and she's from the Hamilton County Coroner's Office, and she, thank goodness, opted in to be recorded. So she was explaining kind of the procedure of when they get a body for autopsy, what they do. They'll x-ray the body first to find bullet locations. And then they'll take photos as they are. They literally unzip the body bag, get pictures as they came to them. Uh, So it shows the clothes they came in, just literally how they were. When they get the body, they document the clothing and personal items that they have and put all that into evidence. Now, in a situation where somebody dies in an accident, it's not put into evidence. It's given to the family. But this is, they are crime scenes. Their bodies are crime scenes and everything on their body is a crime scene. 
So they unclothe the victim and take more photos as they are. They don't clean them up just yet. They, they're still bloody. All homicides cases, they take fingernails. That's an indication of struggle. It can be. If the, if the fingernails are chipped or broken, that can be a sign of a struggle. Also, you have DNA under those fingerprints if there was a fight. Then they will take hair for DNA. They took hair off of Chris and Gary's head and also facial hair. They get fingerprints, all that good stuff. So she said at this point, the doctor is not in the morgue yet. They have um, morgue techs that collect samples like blood, eye fluid for toxicology and things like that. They also get urine. Now, I did work in a morgue for three years and it's very interesting to watch the autopsy process. And so I had a case come through. I actually was on the organ donation team. So anytime we had a donor, I would take corneas out or the whole eye globe. But I was in there when they did autopsies. And there were two men that came in with point blank gunshot wounds to the face. And so I, I, I understand the trauma of what these jurors are having to see every day because these are people that don't sign up for this. This is why these people are not medical examiners. They don't want to see bodies in this shape. It can be very traumatizing. I know um, one juror of the Jody Arias trial had to go have therapy afterwards after seeing Travis's body. So there are effects even on the jurors. So finally, at this point, the doctor comes down and starts working on the diagram. We're going to talk about the diagram. I have copies of the diagram. And then they clean the body. They, when they do the diagram, they note any kind of injuries, scars, tattoos. The body is cleaned. They take more photos. Then they start the autopsy. I want to, before we get into this autopsy, this poor judge. Okay, so I know Pike County is probably very, very small. And I would imagine most of the cases that come through there are either drug related or maybe domestic violence. But she was explaining how on the photo that we didn't see that was on screen for Chris Sr., there was something white beside his eye. And she was explaining that what had happened was a fly had laid an egg right beside his eye. And the judge, his facial expression, you can tell a lot of this. He probably hasn't seen anything of this caliber his whole career. I am not laughing about it. It's just his face. Um, he was horrified. So anyways, so with the gunshot wound, you can tell an entrance and exit wound, usually how far away they were shot from. And as a bullet hits the skin, it's spinning. So when it comes out, it's spinning and it can tear the skin, but it is kind of around the hole and it's like an abrasion. So exit tears its way out. And it can be small or big. So the entrance is usually a hole. The exit can, if it's in the head, it can blow the whole back of the skull out. I've seen that too. So they talk about um, the soot on the skin and then the, um, the stippling where you know that muzzle was pressed against the skin. So she talks about immediately after death, three things start happening. Number one, the heart stops, blood settles. With gravity, where you're laying, your blood will start to pool. So after 24 hours, that blood is fixed. You can roll somebody on their belly, but the blood stays. But up until that point, if you were to move the deceased person on their stomach, that blood would go with the gravity of the body. So number two, uh, rigor mortis, stiffening starts right away. That maxes out 24 hours after you die. Then you get into decomposition. 24 hours later, um, it's, it's noticeable and you become floppy again. So that rigor mortis goes away because your body is starting to decompose, the muscles and everything. So Pike County would send their cases to Hamilton and called their office the day after the bodies were found and said they had several people who were victims of homicide and would be coming to them. So Dr. Kessler is the Pike County coroner, and he decides whether it's a natural death or if an autopsy is necessary, but does not perform autopsies, much like um, 
Idaho for Chad and Lori if you if you're following that case. Speaking of which, there's been a little development with Melanie. So I'm gonna do a short here after this. So she talked to Dr. Kessler and learned that it it was a family of eight that were murdered. And he asked if sending eight to her was too many or should he split them up? And she said she needed all eight so that one person handles it. The reports are uniform. Um, you know, everybody does things different in their field. She wanted everything to line up in one spot so that that way she would know exactly where this was, what happened here. And it just makes it a little more neat, I guess. And she was on call that weekend and did all eight autopsies. So the bodies arrived at Hamilton County Coroner's office around 5.30 a.m. on Saturday morning. So this is over 24 hours after the murders. But as you know, they didn't remove those bodies until those crime scenes were, were secure. So the bodies were given a barcode. They're scanned and then they are put into a cooler. They didn't open the body bags until it was time for the autopsy. With eight, she decided that she would do the women on Saturday, the men on Sunday, except for Chris Sr., who appeared to be injured the worst, and she would do his on Monday. So when she collected bullets and fragments, they were given to the BCI agents. Personal effects for, for victims were given to them as well. And she noticed that the bodies were starting to show signs of decomposition because it really does happen very quickly after death. Flies can smell a dead body within 15 minutes, I believe. So because most were found in their beds and had never moved, she did extra toxicology because she noticed it didn't seem that most woke up when the shootings were happening. And she wanted to make sure that they were not drugged to where they didn't hear it. And the other thought she had was there was a silencer. So let's get into Chris Sr.'s autopsy. And we are going to throw up the diagram for his. Uh, they obviously can't show us the crime scene photos, but um, the mock-up is there. I don't know if it makes it big for you if I do that. I'm trying to make it big. But at 5.50 a.m. on the 23rd, his body was entered and put in the cooler. He was the last autopsy, but we're starting with him today. He was more decomposed than the others and had skin coloration changes and was no longer stiff. His abdomen was a little green, and that's from bacteria in your intestines that starts to grow after you die. And also, gases uh, start forming and bloat the body. And can I just say, I forgot to give a trigger warning. If you are very sensitive to graphic um, crime body conditions after multiple gunshot wounds, this might not be your episode. So I just want to throw that in. We don't have any pictures that are graphic, but we do have what I'm saying is going to be graphic. She saw a, a large number of gunshot wounds to the face and two in his abdomen. So the x-ray showed several bullets that were still inside his body to recover. His organs were actually starting to fall apart, which is another, um, sign of decomposition 31 hours from the time he was murdered and placed in the cooler so that's how long his body had been out now the drive was an hour and a half from pike to hamilton where they were done so about 28 hours these bodies were inside these locations not refrigerated so de decomposition is going to be a little quicker and she said that the time frame of 31 hours was consistent with the decomposition that she observed when they unzipped the body bag. So the right forearm gunshot wound that he had, we know that I think it came from outside one of the boys laying low. Um, and that was probably near the porch area. I think I do have that slide. If you can see um, here I will put the thing on the screen. So you see where they found the shell casings there on the porch. And then, like we said yesterday around that chair. So that was, um, you know, but she, she thinks that the arm wound was a high powered rifle 
And the arm was, she said it was so destroyed and lacerated. You could see muscle and fractured bone. And the arm was barely hanging on the end of his elbow. Likely a high-powered rifle or shotgun. It was different from all the other wounds. I fully think Jake was the one that pulled the trigger. If you remember, George was kind of frozen. So Jake took over. Then they show x-rays of the head, not to us, but to the jury. There are areas of intense white that show up and also metal shows up white. He did have some fillings in his teeth and at the corner of the left side of his teeth, it's kind of right here where she's pointing. You can see on the diagram as well. Um, where your lip ends, you see a bullet hole. Near the ear were two bullet holes. So she's talking about the x-rays at this point. In the middle of the head, you see bullet fragments. X-rays show the chin, the neck, and the ribs. There's a bullet in his back on the left side. Then she shows a photo of his belly. In the middle of his abdomen was a bullet and fragments. Actually, Chris Roden had had a big surgery before he was murdered, and there were staples seen on that x-ray from this previous surgery. We don't know what kind. If you guys know, I know a lot of you people are local. Uh, let me know in the comments. But the right forearm, the forearm bones are fractured in many pieces. You can see bullet fragments that they call a snowstorm effect, which is an indication of a high-powered rifle. And then as far as the hips, the pelvis, and the lower spine, there were tiny pieces of fragments, but some were too small to collect. So the intact bullets were recovered, and it was impossible to get anything from his forearm. It was just, it was mangled, y'all. They found bullets and fragments in the body bag and the sweatshirt. So when he came to them, both arms still above his head, and the sweatshirt was covering his face. At, and she said, as if somebody maybe grabbed that sweatshirt and was dragging. So we know that according to what Jake said, Billy and George drugged that body while he was out, probably getting the DVRs in the grow house. Remember, he went down in Chris Sr.'s pockets to get those keys. We learned yesterday those DVRs were in that grow house. So you can kind of picture one of them at the top, one at the bottom, dragging these bodies and they explained when they're drugged, you know, by their feet or whatever, it pulls the clothing up and the hands are above their heads. So when they pulled the um, sweatshirt down, two intact bullets fell out of his brown sweatshirt. A third one fell out of his clothing and fell on the floor as they were undressing him. So they show photos of them opening the body bag and the sweatshirt is still over his face. Then they show several other photos. He has brown paper bags over his hands to preserve any kind of evidence that might be on there. They show an overhead picture of the lower half of him that shows his jeans and his shoes. Overhead shots of his right knee. There's some spots on his pants. I'm assuming blood spots. He had injuries to the left forehead and side of the face, abrasions and punctures of tiny pieces of wood sticking out on his skin, on his forehead and cheek. And Big E sent me a drawing he did because he was in there today. It looked like his face was maybe like full of these wood fragments where the door was hit and he was right there. There was a lot. And, and Big E said there was a lot. There was white above the eye and like we said that was because uh a fly had laid an egg on his eye and the judge bless it i don't think he's seen anything like this uh he was very engaged today the prosecutor gives the witness evidence in envelopes these are really small envelopes it contains stuff like facial hair fingernails the clippers that they use to get the fingernails fingerprints a dna card plastic bullet box that they put bullets in that they collect while they're doing the autopsy and they're separated by where they were found. So there's one little plastic box for a shirt, one little plastic box for um, bullets that came out of the skull and, and so on. So the defense quickly stipulates the bullets found in Chris's shirt as the forensic pathologist is opening them 
saying they're willing to stipulate to all evidence on the body. And really, they did not want the clothing or the bullet shown was kind of my opinion. They were every time we stipulate and, and then the prosecutor's like, well, yeah, we're going to show the sweatshirt. So she hands the evidence bag with the following items of Chris's that they did not show. It included his boxers removed from his body, the brown bags that were on his hands when he got there. And then they uh, open up the bag and show the hoodie to the um, to Chris. This is Chris Sr.'s hoodie that he was murdered in. And it has bullet holes. It's kind of hard to see here. The back of that was saturated with blood. You also could see a lot of blood on that arm that had been mangled from that rifle shot. These photos are courtesy of Kathy Russin. It's at Kathy Russin on Twitter, my buddy uh, from Long Crime Network. So she had the best pictures. So I grabbed those and I'm giving her some big credit for it. So that, like we say, the back of this is covered with uh, just body fluids and, and, and blood. Um, also, that's his undershirt. So... On the diagram, she starts from the top to the bottom and tries to figure out what's an entrance wound and what's an exit wound. So with someone shot that many times in the face, she said, you just do your best. If the head isn't too damaged, you can follow where it goes in the head and then you can see if the bullet's there or if it came out and there's an exit wound. So you can also follow that blood trail through the body. On Chris Sr., he had six shots to the face, and they were all entrance wounds. If you're looking at the diagram, they start at the nose and go in a linear pattern, which is kind of down. Uh, I will put these photos on the drive. The link will be in the description of anywhere you're, you're watching or reading this, y'all. So you follow the blood trail through the body, and then that can kind of tell you what it's hit. But on Chris Sr., he had six shots to the face. They were all entrance wounds. One was by his nose. The black is the hole. And the red around the hole is the abrasion. And this indicates an entrance. So when you have an entrance wound, they can tell it's an entrance by the way the skin kind of comes up in that entrance wound. And they show a photo of the right side of his face off camera, and there are six holes. And this is where Big E was like, man, this was brutal. I'm seeing if you guys can see that. I'm hoping you can because it's much bigger. So you have one right by the nostril. You have one just kind of behind where the very edge of your lip ends. One kind of where your the the back of your jaw would be and then there's one even further back than that so then there's also one directly in the front of the face and then one underneath the chin just brutal y'all i mean i was so shocked to see this it is just insane so what i did was kind of broke these apart a little bit to give you a better view so on, on the diagram, she starts and she tries to figure out entrance and exits wounds and the path the bullet took, but it, it, it just wasn't going to happen. The shooter was close, though. There was soot with uh, red dots around the forehead and cheek. So those are intermediate range. I'm going to put up on screen these different ranges because it can get a little bit confusing, but it also tells how far away the muzzle of that gun was from clothing or skin. And this is a big part of, of her testimony. So the shooter was close. There was soot with red dots around the forehead and cheek. So those are intermediate range, which means about one to three feet away. I wonder if I can put two pictures up here. It's important to properly dispose of unwanted medication or sharps. MedProject offers free and convenient disposal options near you. To learn more, call 844-MEDPROJECT or visit medproject.org. Let me see. Mm, no, I'll figure this out when I'm not live on camera. So 
some were loose contact and that's where the um the gun is extremely close to the skin zero inches into the muzzle to the body the furthest it would be is one millimeter or an inch so uh there were some very close-up shots um some were loose contact which means the gun i'm sorry did i say that yes um you get a narrow ring of gunpowder around the, the the wound with that loose contact, by the way. And that lets them know that this was pretty much point blank. So number one on the cheek. We're going to go back to our diagram. Number one on the cheek. It's loose contact, which means that it was pretty much right against his skin. And let's see here. Uh, the cheek wound exited behind the right ear. So she shaved his beard around the wound, but you see the gray soot in a circle. It's very close. Probably pushed that um, right up to his skin. Uh, the one close to the nose, that's bullet number two, across the face to the back of the head. So it, it ended up on the left side with the bullet lodged in the skull. Number bullet num number three, the same thing. The uh, diagram shows just past where the corner of your upper lip is. We talked about that. It went to the back of the head. Gunshot wound number four. There was a downward trajectory that ended up in his spine. This is brutal, guys. Right where the spine is attached to the bottom of the skull. It actually severed his skull from the spine. The bullet was found in the top of his spine. And when that happens is called internal decapitation. Literally he was decapitated. His bones were decapitated inside his body. That bullet just separated the spine from the skull. Insane. Wow. I mean, I've never heard of that. I can't wait to hear Joseph Scott Morgan's take on all this he is amazing and so smart and will do a much better job than me but uh when he posts his his video about this i'm gonna retweet that and put a link here in the community where you can go listen to that so bullet hole number five was kind of at the back of the lower jawline it went across the head like two and three did and it exited behind the left ear Number six, if you're looking at the diagram on screen, it is the chin shot from, it kind of looks like the chin is propped up. It went under his skin, across his neck and shoulder, and it was found in his back. The shot next to the nose was likely fired from above when Chris was down. So you see how these shots are in a line, and that's called a linear pattern. That shots two, three, four, and five just in that line down past his nose. That is somebody standing over him while he's down and just firing nonstop. And she explains if Chris had been moving, the, wo the wounds would not be that close or in a line. So you see this is overkill. I think at this point Chris Sr. is down. Obviously, he's not moving, and I just don't buy the story of Billy running out. I shot my best friend. I think Billy realized he about got shot and was freaking out. So they show these autopsy photos to the jury, and she shows the injuries from the diagram in those real flip photos and goes through each wound. Now, gunshot number seven was in the right chest, and the path was through the ribs on the front of his chest, and it went through the heart. It injured his esophagus, scratched the side of the thoracic vertebrae, which is up here, and went between the ribs and stopped between the skin surface and the ribs. That was a fatal wound. That would have been a fatal wound. The distance was loose contact, so we know that was in close proximity. Let's see here. Um in the front of the sweatshirt, there was a rim around the hole it made in the sweatshirt of Sut. So the gun was held right to his chest and it got stuck on the clothing. Number eight, wound number eight was the left abdomen gunshot wound. I 
don't know that they put um, abdomen shots up. If they did, I missed it. But that was just above the belly button. This was not a close shot. It went through the skin, the liver, the large and small intestines, the kidney, muscles, and ended up under the skin. Eventually, this wound would have been fatal, but not instantly. Without excellent treatment, she said it would have taken him a couple of days to die from that. Um, so the gunshot wounds to the head, one through five, would have been instantly fatal. The one under his chin, it damaged some soft tissue in his neck and his carotid artery. He probably could have survived that with quick, quick treatment. But all in all, she said they're very serious injuries. So we get to gunshot wound number nine, which is the right forearm. And that arm was shredded into pieces. Couldn't determine a distance, but it was greater than three feet. She wasn't able to tell what path that bullet took in the forearm. And so she goes through the bullets in the little evidence boxes that were in Chris's body. They take photos during the autopsy up close of his hands to see if there's trauma like nails, uh, broken or chipped or torn that could indicate a struggle. She also did a normal exam on him and there was nothing remarkable other than the trauma. His toxicology was positive for only caffeine. Initially, it said positive for benzodiazepines, but she explains if you're taking that test on somebody who's alive, that's really what it's meant for. And only in freshly dead people is it kind of an effective test, but decomposition caused a false positive in Chris. So it can also happen with amphetamines where you haven't taken amphetamines, but decomposition can contribute to that. And could the gunshot wound to the arm cause his death? She said potentially in that he could have bled to death from the trauma. So she listed the cause of death, multiple gunshot wounds to the head and torso. And that was it with that. So we're going to go to Chris Sr. I mean, I'm sorry, Gary Roden. His autopsy was done the day before on the 24th, 30 hours since the murder. They show photos like with Chris as soon as they open the body bag, hands above the head, photo from the top down, all the clippings and shavings, and she's handed all these envelopes like she did with Chris. She's given a personal effects. He had a $10 bill in his pants and some change. They show photos to the jury. Uh, the back of the pants had a blood stain above the back pocket. The back of the T-shirt was saturated with blood. I believe, actually, this T-shirt here might have been Gary's. That's uh, so that I got, Chris. Uh, there were two holes in his sweatshirt. The x-rays showed three gunshot wounds to the head with exit wounds. One was on his face. Another was on the right temple area and behind his ear. So distance from gun number one. Let's throw this diagram back up there for Gary. Number one, entrance was on the back of the head, kind of to the left side. And the exit wound was on the left side of that forehead. You can kind of see in the diagram on the left where that came out. And it had an abrasion collar, which tells her in the back that was the entry wound. The distance for that was um, indeterminate. She couldn't tell, but it wasn't anything that was close. He had a hat on. And so she's asked, would it be consistent with a hole in the ball cap damage as well as the bill? Because remember, he was shot in the back of the head. It traveled through, came out the forehead. And so we know that Gary's hat was found at the scene. Couldn't really get a good up close picture of that hat, but you could see the bullet hole in the back as well as the bill. If you could imagine the bill's hard, how it separates from the soft part that kind of sits on your head. That's essentially how that hat looked. So um, they show the hat to the jury. And so number two, gunshot wound number two, left temple entrance at his sideburn. So you can kind of imagine right around this area. And there's a hole in the back. Let's see. I'm sorry. The distance was contact. So right up against, I mean, execution style. They're searing where the muzzle touched him. 
Also, there's a rectangle mark, which could be where the muzzle was pushed in his head. Exit wound couldn't associate that bullet wound with the two exit wounds because his brain had started to um, decompose. So there was no path that she could follow for the two that went through the brain to find out where they went. Number three is along the jaw side on the left hand here. You see that little hole right at the jawline. And that had stip stippling with polka dots going up from the wound. And that's intermediate contact, which is about three inches or less. So very close range. They also show a photo that we don't see where the head looks misshapen. And that's because the skull bones underneath are broken and kind of coming through the skin. There were abrasions and bruising around the eyes because the bony plates behind the eyes were broken. The vessels bleed and it kind of looks like somebody got punched in the eye, but it's actually from the trauma behind it. Now, here's what's interesting. There are injuries to his left hand and forearm that looked fresh. She said it could be from a fight right before death, but also it could be him falling after he was shot. But if you remember, Billy's in the house. We Jake is firing at Chris. Chris makes it inside, kind of seems to go around that, that chair there. You only have Billy inside at that point, and you've got Chris and Gary. So it's not out of the question to think that maybe – Gary engaged Billy for a second, and that's how he got so close, and we had these contact wounds. I don't know. I'm just thinking. Toxicology reports for Gary, he was positive for cocaine and caffeine, and we know in that safe that we talked about yesterday, they found cocaine. Cause of death, multiple gunshot wounds to the head. She said any of those gunshot wounds to the head would have been fatal because they crossed into his brain. Any shot could have caused him to fall. And regarding the bullet that was stuck in the right side of his temple area, it could have been that he was already on the ground when the shot was fired, which the ground stopped that bullet from exiting fully. So on cross-exam, Parker was up for the defense, and he asked about the refrigeration of the bodies, and there was a mobile refrigeration unit that they used to transfer the eight victims from Pike to Hamilton. And she said, um, she's asked, you don't know the sequence of the gunshot wounds. No, she doesn't know what order or who was killed first. She doesn't know. So with Chris, the contact distance between the end of the muzzle touching the body or clothing is zero. He goes down and I'm, that's the graphic that I put up here. So I'm not going to repeat what he says, but essentially he made a list on a big notepad in the courtroom of how far away these terms meant intermediate three inches to three feet indeterminate three feet to infinity loose contact into muzzle to the body millimeter or up to an inch contact on the skin so they agree um he says uh that wounds number one through eight were made with a similar weapon now we know that jake got him in the arm with the high-powered rifle but i believe billy had the glock the 40 Glock. So they were all, the rest of the wounds were the same. And for somebody very upset that he just shot his best friend so much that his boys had to calm him down in the middle of their murder spree tells me um, that's overkill. That's overkill. I fully think Chris was on the ground dying when he got the linear just in a row shots. Mm, evil people, y'all. This is just, I, I don't, I, I can't grasp it. And then you're not even talking about, um, the, the other six. These are the first two. So um, follow-up questions. You have no idea which wound was first. Um, she's, she said no. Then the defense says the one to his arm, that would have been extremely painful. And she said yes, of course. And the other ones would have been painful. And she says the ones to his torso would. Uh, the head shots would have rendered him unconscious pretty quickly. And gunshot wound number seven, you said, was a contact wound in his chest near the heart that struck the heart, among other things. And she says, yes. He asked, are there any wounds to the head from behind? And she said, no. All of Chris Sr.'s were from the front or the side. Wounds two, three, four, and five were all on the cheek. And you don't know if he was alive when those were administered. And she said, no. 
Then he says, I'm not going to go through everybody else's autopsy. Is it fair to say the other victims have numerous gunshot wounds except one, Kenneth? And that's and, and she says, well, it's still in the face. And the defense says Chris is the only one that has gunshot wounds to the arm, torso, or abdomen. But here's the thing. We know Chris Sr. was awake. So he's moving. He's not a sleeping target. I, I mean, it's like, why are we talking about this? It makes total sense why, you know, why he had wounds in his belly. He's trying to get away from him. So Gary, we're going to move to Gary. Here's his graphic. He had three gunshot wounds. Um, and this is on cross. Contact wound A. She answers. Number two had a muzzle stamp. So number two is uh, right there, kind of above or just to the side of the eye. And let's see here. Number one was to the back of his head. Number two was the left temple with the muzzle stamp. And she says, yes. Number three was intermediate into the lower jaw. She says, yes. And so the defense says they entered his brain and then whichever one was first, would he be unconscious immediately? And the forensic pathologist said, yes. So the defense is a little confused about the decomposition. How long these two victims were dead before they were found between 7.30 and 8 a.m. on the 22nd, which was a Friday. Well, we know that Billy went over, um, made that phone call to Billy's phone um, as a ruse to get the shooting started. And it was uh, 10.30 or something like that. So we know shortly after Chris and Gary were murdered. And he says, based on your observations, how long had they been dead? And she says, part of the problem is they're already decomposed when they come to me. And I can work backwards a little bit. But once they were found, I don't know what state they were found. I don't know. She says, I do know they laid there a while since BCI was doing their evidence gathering. So there's no refrigeration. And that was for a long time, 24 hours, probably. So she said, you know, obviously we know they were found between 7.30 and 8, but she doesn't know when they were removed. But she said there, you know, that's a delay in trying to stop decomposition. And the body starts to decompose really fast. So the defense says you were not made aware of when the bodies were put into the refrigeration from the scene. And she said, no, she did not know. So the defense asked, did that hinder your opinion? And she said, not really. <laughs> so the defense says, would it be helpful to know what time they were entered into refrigeration? And she says, yeah, yeah. The defense says, were you given crime scene photos to help with your investigation? And she said, yes. So the defense says, was it helpful to determine when they were killed looking at these photos? And she says, the photos were far away and it doesn't look like they're bloated or overall have a green tint. Uh, but she can't tell for sure. In other words, she's saying it's not advanced days worth of decomposition. Um, the defense says, do you have a, an opinion of when um, they were killed? And she said, based on the condition, when they got to me, from when I pulled them out of the cooler, I would suggest within 48 hours at the most. And she said, there's no exact science to determine that. Longer than we would, longer than that, they would have seen obvious changes. So she knows it's within that time frame. Uh, Gary and Christopher had more changes than the others did. And that's just because they were shot first. So in toxicology on Chris, he had caffeine, false positive for those benzodiazepines. And that was cleared up. And she said, yes, just caffeine. Then uh, Rigor Mortis is absent on Gary, and there, you say there is a pronounced body odor. Is that related to the status of decomposition? And she very kindly said no. He was unbathed for a very long period of time. The defense is saying that there are some medical terms he doesn't understand, so he's asking her. You say it's indentulous. I think I said that right, which means he had no teeth. No dysmorphic features. What does that mean? So 
let's say that you break your leg really bad and it's facing that way while your le normal legs facing the right way. None of that was present on the bodies. Their legs were in the correct position. So, um, and then he asked if he had tattoos and she said, yes. So on redirect with Chris and Gary being more composed, could it be they were killed a few hours before the others and were there for hours after? And she said, yes. So the prosecution points out it was 28 hours before they got to you. Were their body conditions consistent with that time frame? And she said, yes. And she, the prosecutor points out being refrigerated, it doesn't stop decomposition, but it does slow it down. And she agrees. So the prosecution said there were injuries Chris received that were render him unconscious. Which ones? And she said any of the ones to his head. The prosecution said the chest wound would render him unresponsive. And she said, no, if you're shot in the heart, every time your heart beats, you're pouring blood into your chest cavity. And Chris Sr. did have a liter of blood in his chest. That's less blood bringing oxygen to your brain. So eventually you pass out and die. But she said you can run a block or two after being shot in the heart, but the loss of blood eventually kills you. Um, number nine, which was the arm shot, was the only shot from a high-powered rifle, and the forensic examiner says yes. She says one through eight was from the same weapon, not the rifle. She said that's correct. And then she asked, how would a muffler impact your, a muffler, a muzzle, <laughs> impact your determinations of how far away the weapon would have been? And the forensic pathologist said the purpose of the silencer is not to make a loud noise. It wouldn't slow a bullet. It wouldn't deviate it. It may reduce the sound, but it's not going to affect the gunshot itself or the damage it does. So... Also on this diagram for Gary, that's where um, above that back shot on the back side of his head, you see that gunshot wound above. That was actually the, the part where um, the fractured skull was coming through the skin. So the they brought back that investigator yesterday from yesterday with the beard. I can't think of his name right now. He started about Frankie and Hannah Hazel's house on the outside. Um, trial ended for the day. So tomorrow, I'll get into that. I want to keep this kind of separate. I want each autopsy episode and house evidence episode to be their own. Just later, it's easy to go back to if you want to, you know, in a year, look at Frankie's or whoever. So that's all for tonight, my people. Uh, I appreciate you guys hanging out with me. And a very interesting case. It's a lot of technical stuff, but you got me to break it down for you in what? 46 minutes. So there you go. All right. Tomorrow we'll jump on Frankie and Hannah Hazel. Saturday, I will finish up the Netflix uh, Sins of Our Mother episode three. You guys are enjoying that. And I appreciate everything y'all do. I really do. Uh, you guys are the best. All right. Have a good night. With no fees or minimums and no overdraft fees, banking with Capital One is the easiest decision in the history of decisions. Even easier than choosing to keep the Grinch away from the toy drive. He's going to deliver the toys to the kids. What about me, the Grinch? No. Yep, even easier than that. You steal the presents one time. With no fees or minimums and no overdraft fees, is it even a decision? That's banking reimagined. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. Capital One NA member FDIC. Copyright Dr. Seuss Enterprises. Copyright Turner Entertainment Company. Breast milk science. It's a thing. And it's our thing. We're by heart. We're an infant formula company on a mission to get a lot closer to the most super, super food on the planet. Breast milk. Our patented protein blend has more of the important and most abundant proteins found in breast milk. We're the first and only U.S.-made formula to use organic, grass-fed whole milk, not skim. We make our formula in our own factories in Iowa, Oregon, and Pennsylvania, using a small batch manufacturing process that works to preserve the integrity of our ingredients. We ran the largest clinical trial by a new infant formula company in 25 years and clinically proved benefits like easier digestion, less gas, and softer poops versus a leading infant formula. We were the first infant formula company to earn the Clean Label Project Purity Award. And while we've put a lot into Byheart, there's a long list of things you won't see on our ingredient list. Like no corn syrup, no maltodextrin, no GMO ingredients, no soy, no palm oil. Byheart, a better formula for formula. 
Learn more at byheart.com.